one chap was a rather quiet and diffident sort of character, and uh, he was wearing para wings on his uniform. I discovered that he had been at Goose Green, and he was telling me that it was quite. He said it was quite uh, lively when a Beaufort's anti-aircraft gun was being fired in the horizontal at you. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list to keep up with the latest episode. The Home Service Force, or HSF, was UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's Cold War version of the World War II Home Guard. An almost forgotten force, the HSF was established in 1982 and recruited from ex-regular army, ex-territorial and ex-uniformed service personnel aged up to 60 years old. Its mission was to guard key points in the UK as the perceived threat from Warsaw Pact Special Forces increased towards the end of the Cold War. I speak with Richard Coles, who served as an officer in two HSF company of the Honourable Artillery Company, and he tells of the setup of the unit, the incredible characters he served with, and details of some of the exercises that he participated in. The Cold War conversation continues in our vibrant Facebook discussion group and on Twitter. Just search for Cold War Conversations on Facebook, and we're at Cold War Pod on Twitter. Go and look for the links in the episode information. Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, I'm Sean from Perth, Western Australia, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast because these are the real stories of the world I grew up in. And we are uniquely privileged to record the experiences and thoughts of the people who are actually part of the shaping of our lives. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Richard Coles to our Cold War Conversation. The Home Service Force was was first uh, established in 1982 as a pilot scheme when four companies were uh, set up as an experiment to trial the idea. And at that point, it was, uh, they were mostly in the the north of England, in Scotland. Uh, By 1984, the idea had really taken off and it became an official policy to expand it. And... By 1984, there were platoons in 11 cities. And by the following year, there were, I believe, up to 50 companies right across the country. Why were they set up? Why was there a need for the Home Service Force? Well, towards the end of the Cold War, it was increasingly apparent that there were insufficient troops available to card key points. That job was primarily the uh, a function, a responsibility of the regular army and a limited number of TA soldiers. But they will, the, the number of TA soldiers allocated to the home defence w- was really woefully inadequate. So it was decided to set up 5,000 or more reservists who were to be deployed in that specific role. The TA that you mention is the Territorial Army, the sort of uh, British Army's reserve. Absolutely. It's no longer called that, but for many years it's the Territorial Army. And the Home Service Force was simply an additional section within the Territorial Army on on different terms of engagement, different uh, training and so on. The idea being that the Home Service Force, with its sort of limited function, guarding key points, it was suitable for people who were already trained soldiers, but by virtue of their limited role and also their previous experience, they didn't need to do the full territorial army training of typically one weekend a month 
two weeks in the summer and so forth, the HSF units were set up on the basis that it would simply be four or five weekends a year, plus regular annual uh, shooting and so on training, uh, and one evening a month rather than one evening a week, as was common throughout the rest of the TA. How similar would you say it was to Britain's World War II Home Guard in terms of its uh, composition? I'm not an expert on the World War II Home Guard, other than perhaps watching the Dad's Army comedy on the television, which has been a very popular uh, program over years. I, I think, in truth, the Home Service was was m- more professional because I believe the Home Guard it was old soldiers and young men who were perhaps not old enough to join the regular army or not yet old enough to be mobilised. The Home Service Force recruits were required to have a minimum of two years' service in the Territorial Army or a similar period in the regular Navy, Royal Marines, Army or Air Force. Uh, It also included officers and adult instructors in the Army Cadet Force. And also there were a few people who were former MOD, Ministry of Defence policemen. So that the people were generally people who were fully trained as as reservists or indeed uh, ex-regulars. How were they recruited? Was it word of mouth or was there some advertising put out or was it depending on who you knew? Once the thing got off the ground in 84 to 85, there was a national uh, campaign to recruit. And certainly in my own regiment, the Honourable Artillery Company, usually known as the HAC, uh, within the HAC, when it was when it was announced that the HAC would be providing two companies of Home Service Force soldiers, the veterans, the, the newsletters, and the veterans system advertised the fact that people were invited to join. And at the beginning, probably about half of the people were people who had recently retired from the uh, regular squadrons, the HAC, uh, or perhaps were contemplating uh, retirement, perhaps because of uh, competing um, responsibilities and difficulty in meeting training commitments and so on. So those people just moved across uh, and were recruited into into the Home Service Force. And they were recruited in virtually all cases, as private soldiers. So people would turn up who had been previously serving or had served as officers, and they would be uh, joined the HSF as private soldiers. One or two at the very beginning were the platoon commanders, were people that were uh, experienced guys, either from the HAC or outside, and they, were, they came in and were recruited directly as officers. Was there an age limit? on uh, who could volunteer? Well, the the minimum age limit, I suppose, was 20, because in order to uh, have two years' service, that would be the 20 would be the realistic bottom end. At the top end, uh, the uh, the run-out date age was 60, and so when they were recruiting, they were taking people who were up to 50. And I would say that at the beginning... Uh, I joined, I was comparatively old, I joined at the age of 38, and I would say I was younger than the average. There were quite a lot of people coming in in their 50s. Quite a few of them were ex-national servicemen who were coming back. Um, Quite a few were retired regular officers. So there were quite a lot in their late 30s and early 40s. They were fit guys. Everybody had to sort of demonstrate that they, they, they were fit and would pass medical and so on. Um, but the age, yes, I would say mid, mid-30s to early 50s was the sort of age bracket from the beginning. What was the, the sort of training that they were doing apart from exercises? I mean, how, how was that training handled? There would be a training evening, which was typically uh, two hours on a weekday evening, um, and that would consist of a bit of weapon handling, basic things of this sort. Uh, there would be lectures from outside uh, outside units, 
people would come in talking about EODs, explosive ordnance devices. There would be engineers talking about engineering issues, a, a range of subjects that were relevant to, to the role, really. Yeah. And so this was, this was an easy, obviously in a two hour session, you couldn't achieve much, but the training weekends were the, the focus of the training. Uh, and these would commence six o'clock on a Friday evening and go right through to the Sunday afternoon. And that training would be conducted outside London. That will be conducted on a training area. In the course of our training in the HAC, we trained, well, we had a number of exercises that were at RAF stations, RAF Northolt, RAF Biggin Hill. And then we conducted general sort of patrolling and that kind of thing in the open in various training areas, Perbright, Longmoor, Thetford. Some of the training consisted of urban warfare and being in a sort of urban environment. And there were one or two army training areas that had sort of tin cities and uh, disused houses that were used for uh, that kind of that kind of work. And each year, the main exercise, the, the major uh, weekend was organised for us by London District. There's a lot of input from guards. Uh, we would have support from the RAF. I mean, some weekends involved uh, moving us by helicopter to get familiarise ourselves with helicopter use. And so we were transported by helicopter from one training area to another. We had uh, input from quite a few people of you know, external units. Uh, and I think the, the training exercise, the first of these was one that was conducted at RAF Northolt, and that particular one was called Exercise Brave Defender. Um, and that, that was really a test exercise. It was the first occasion that the Home Service Force in Greater London was deployed on mass, as it were, and that particular London district event that comprised the two HAC Home Service Force companies. Then there was one from the well, Green Jackets. There was another from the Para Company, and there was also the, the, the fifth company in Greater London was a Royal Signals Squadron known as the Inns of Court and City Yeomanry. That was a signal squadron based in central London in the Inns of Court. And they had a home service force company. And although they are a Royal Signals Regiment, they were deployed essentially in the um, sort of infantry role, but I suppose probably with an emphasis on the communication side, which was their specialism. So all five home service force companies in Greater London, were met together on one occasion at, at Northolt. There was another similar uh, weekend, I think, in the second year when we had deployed at what was then RAF Biggin Hill, now, now a civilian uh, airfield that then was an RAF station. Well, well we'll uh, talk about those in a little bit more detail later. The threat that you were up against was, or there, there was a fear with NATO during this period of Warsaw Pact special forces, and particularly the Soviet Spetsnaz. Yes, and that was one of the, you know, the the reasons why they needed to expand the home defence areas, also so they could free up some of the territorials. I presume. I don't think it's so much a. <laughs> question of freeing up the territories, it was augmenting the territories that had a home defence function. It was really just an additional additional boots on the ground to assist. I mean, obviously, the, the, the regular army has an important role, but sorry, it, it was just an additional element, probably doing some of the, more, the less glamorous uh, aspects of the home, home defence role, because essentially we were guarding... Uh, these key points, and these key points were ranged from airports, civilian uh, seaports, power stations, oil pipelines, that sort of thing. And um, if you look at the map of Britain as a whole at that time, the number of airfields, the number of ports and so on, 
it, it would have needed, if the threat had been realised, it would have been taken a lot of people to to uh, defend those 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 key points. Of course, the Royal Air Force stations were not really included in this because they have the uh, RAF regiment squadrons that have uh, an infantry role, and also the Royal Auxiliary Air Force, which was the equivalent of the TA for the RAF. Those squadrons were tasked with defending the major RAF stations. So as far as the Home Service Force was concerned, it was it was likely to be that the, the, the civilian airports were the likely place where they would be deployed. And certainly we got the impression that our role was linked with Heathrow. Uh, and uh, in fact, we had one training weekend at Heathrow. Uh, I think we trained, we, we attended in um, civilian clothes rather than in uniform. But we were there liaising with the police who, of course, had the peacetime function of... Um, security at the airport, but we, we went round with the police and we saw what they were doing and so on. What sort of size did the Home Service Force reach and how did that compare to the TA and the regular army? It, it reached about 5,000 people. And I think that the territorial army at that stage was about 80,000, I think. Uh, uh, yes, I think it was about 80,000. And I think they... The British Army at the time was probably 150,000. All these figures, of course, have shrunk dramatically since then. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but that was a kind of order of things. So 5,000 was a fairly modest figure, uh, but it was one that uh, would have hopefully made a difference. And as far as uniform was concerned, for example, with the Honourable Artillery Company, you, you all had the same cap badges, I'm presuming. Yes, the Home Service Force was not a an entity that had its own cap badge. The the units were simply grafted on to ordinary TA units, or in some cases, some regular units. So that, that every Home Service Force company would be based at the same location and share the administrative facilities, share the transport, and so on. That the the main units and the, the uniforms that we wore were identical to the uniforms worn by our corresponding colleagues in the uh, ordinary TA units, with the same cap badges and so on. A difference at all. And and what sort of weaponry were you equipped with? The HAC units were uh, formed in 1985, and we were all issued with standard FLR rifles which was slightly galling because the HEC had moved to SA-80 a couple of years before that. So we were relegated to the older weapons, but they were did the job. And certainly people who were older than the average, who had done national service or seen service in Northern Ireland or something, they would have been very familiar with FLR rifles as the basic personal weapon that they used in the past. So, so the SLR was the weapon which everyone had, including officers. Uh, I think on some some weekends we had LMGs, old brain guns, that were used as a, a light machine gun. But uh, later on, a couple of years later, we 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 handed in the SLRs and we were given new SA-80s. What what was the sort of heaviest uh, weaponry that you were trained to use? Uh, the light machine gun was the heaviest. So the Bren was still being used even in the 1980s then? It was. Of course, it had common common uh, ammunition with the SLR, um, and there was probably plenty of ammunition to use up. Yeah. Uh, were you paid for this role? Oh, yes, we were paid. We received standard rates of pay for TA personnel of our rank and so forth. So, yes, it was the same pay. The, the, the one difference was that the... Uh, Mainstream TA had a bounty, uh, which was a tax-free bounty paid on completion of satisfactory service at the end of each training year in the, in the order of a few hundred pounds. I can't remember what it was now, but uh, it ran into a few hundred pounds. That was tax-free. Because our training obligation was of a lower level, the, the bounty that we received was 
produced pro rata. So, you know, it was fairly modest amount, but uh, it was quite a nice thing. It would buy a, a meal out or, you know, help towards a holiday or something. Um, yes, but the, the pay was the same. The pay was the same as for the, for the TA. Right, right. And how did you get to uh, end up in the in the home service force? How did you receive the call? I'm a solicitor by profession, and I joined the TA in 1975. I'd always been fascinated by the, the Army, and at a suitable moment in my career, I, I wanted to join the TA, particularly with the IRA threat at the time. It seemed, you know, it seemed something that was important to do for me. And so I joined in 75, and I, having trained in the HAC, I served for three years in one of the Sabre squadrons, uh, and subsequently doing um, spe- special OP, special observer. After a couple of two, three years doing that, I decided to move across to the gun troop, and I was doing conventional gunnery OP work there. But by that time, I had two children, and I was a partner in a law firm, very busy, traveling a lot abroad on business, and it became a difficult to continue so i decided to retire which i at the time i was something i was you know, unhappy that i had to do but i would have liked to carry on two years after that the home service force was established and when i read about this in the newsletter or whatever it would have been at the time i jumped at the idea and of course that's what prompted me to to to, to join what was your your role within the uh, honorable artillery's home service force company well, I joined, uh, and I joined as a company quartermaster sergeant. Not a job I had done before, but I, I knew the company sergeant major very well. I, I, I knew the officer, several of the officers in the company, and they invited me to take on that role, which I was very happy to do. And um, I did that for three or four years. And then when a vacancy occurred, and I'd had a not had enough, but I, I decided I didn't want to spend my entire time as a CQMS. Uh, a vacancy occurred for an officer, and I was commissioned as a temporary second lieutenant at the age of 41, which is quite bizarre in some respects. Uh, and so I became um, a platoon commander. I did that for three or four years, and towards the end... Um, in my last year, I became the company uh, second in command. So I had you know, an interesting time and I thoroughly enjoyed it. What were the people like that you served with? Was there a, a real mixture of, uh, of people there? Well, it was a very nice mixture. I mean, the, the um, Honourable Artillery Company is based just out, the city, out of the city of London and the, the people in the, the regiment the majority probably work in the city of London, so they are, well, they were at that time, there were a lot of people who were in insurance industry, banking industry, financial services, lawyers, surveyors, professional people in the main. They were people who joined the TA. They were very committed to the TA. It was a hobby, but it was not just a hobby. It was a part-time job, which they took very seriously. When we started, uh, probably... Two thirds of the people were from the HAC of the past, and all of the officers were people who either had served in the HAC as territorial army soldiers, or in a couple of cases as regular soldiers who subsequently moved to the TA or were posted to the regiment during their regular service. So a mixture of reservists and regulars. The home service was, was was very interesting because it introduced into the HSF people who perhaps we wouldn't have met or come across in the traditional HAC squadrons. There were quite a number who served in other units. I mean, looking, sort of thinking about those people, they, they were two ex-Royal Marine officers there were several people who were infantry, regular infantry officers, either national service or full career. That covered um, Cheshire Regiment, 
uh, Gurkha rifles, Royal Air Force. There's one Royal Air Force officer. He didn't stay very long, but he uh, went off and took a commission and went ill. Yes, one of the very few people in the AKC who wore RAF wings on his combat kit. <laughs> that was that was unusual. Uh, a couple of people who were in the SAS. And then in terms of uh, soldiers rather than officers, uh, people were from all walks of life, really. I mean, in my, my platoon, when I was a platoon commander, my platoon sergeant was an ex TA Sergeant Major of Royal Signals for many, many years, and he was a porter at uh, one of the London public schools, and uh, several guys were security guards. One chap was an engineer, worked on London transport trains as an engineer. So there were people from all sorts, really, a couple of people who were cooks. So it was... Uh, the same sort of mixture you'd probably get in an army unit, but you know, so they were the less of the city types and probably a broader background, which was all for the good, really. Particularly the guys that were national servicemen, they were the sort of guys that knew exactly what the drill was, they knew perhaps the shortcut, they knew what to do, and uh, giving them a job, you know, giving them a shovel, shovel or a tent uh, trench to dig, they just got on with it. They knew what they had to do, they were trained, they'd been around for a few years, they just got on with it. Uh, many of the jobs were not particularly exciting. Um, you know, guard, it was very much a static thing. Having set up one's base around a key point, you had to sort of establish a defensive area, put out sentries, send out patrols, um, a quick reaction force with a Land Rover to go out and grab anybody at a turn, which needed grabbing. Um, but a lot of hanging around, which in the winter time, you know, in a wet cold. But then most people who've been in the infantry are used to wet and cold. So, you know, just got on with it, really. Was it a more relaxed hierarchy or or was it, I'm giving you an order, you go and do it? I mean, how how, how did that sort of work? Well, the, the HAC has a sort of informality about it because most of the soldiers, I mean, certainly now, the majority, vast majority of graduates, uh, they're all intelligent people. So if, because they're all reasonably intelligent, they, they they know what to do and they get on with it. Of course, when it comes to orders and so on, well, order is an order, whoever, and it's followed accordingly. But it's, it's probably not quite as uh, formal as perhaps a regular army unit would be or, or a, or a uh, TA unit out of London, I would say. Yes, I mean, I had a, a, a one of my dormant cooks when I was in the platoon. <laughs> commander he was a, a garage mechanic by trade well actually he ran his own garage business and he was a sort of core blimey sort of cockney character um but he had been in the hac corps of drums for years uh, regularly stood in at the guards at buckingham palace and you know for public duties and he always called me color he never called me by my first name uh and um he was always pick up anybody who showed any informality he would sort of scowl at and uh, acted like a, a guardsman would 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 behave he was a, a nice guy but he knew what the job was and knew how the regular army would would behave and perhaps we outside informality is something that he would find uh he would find slightly distasteful <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you were you know when you were a platoon commander you were on first name terms with the rest of the platoon Probably, probably last name. I mean, it depends what we were doing. If we were on show, on display, then I might, I, I, I might lapse into Christian name terms if that seemed more appropriate. Mm. So it, it was, it was not as formal as uh, you would expect in a regular unit. There must have been some great characters there and people who had done quite significant service. So were there any that that sort of stood out? Aside from your uh, Cockney garage uh, owner, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, oh yes. I mean, great number of characters. The company sergeant major was a career soldier in the Grenadier Guards, and he was um, W O one R Q M S. I think in his battalion, his last role in the regular army was as regimental sergeant major of the H A C. That's a tradition that we always have a 
Guards Regular Sergeant Major. And um, after leaving the army, he, within about a year, I mean, he left the army and went into uh, facilities management with one of the big building contracting firms. When the HSF was formed, he, he put his hand up and became Sergeant Major. I knew him quite well from my service. Uh, and he, well, he had a lot of tales to tell. I mean, he had done multiple tours in Northern Ireland, and so he was very good as an instructor because you know, he had been dealing with not not the Spetsnaz, but dealing with the IRA and and defending installations and so on. So he was a, he was and he was a great character. So as well, uh, who else? Yes, I mean, I mentioned one chap who was in the Cheshire who was a lovely man who joined us. I think in uh, eighty seven. And he turned up and he was a rather quiet and diffident sort of character uh, on the first weekend. And uh, he was wearing para wings on his uniform, uh, but quiet and so on. And I discovered that he had been a career soldier in the, in the uh, Cheshire's. And uh, during the Falklands War, he was attached to, to para and he commanded one of the companies throughout that war and was, of course, at Goose Green. And he was telling me that it was quite, he said it was quite uh, lively when a, a Bofors anti-aircraft gun was being fired in the horizontal at you, which is, it was quite a lively sort of experience, which I would have thought <laughs> considerable understatement. But he was a, a lovely man, very interesting, very quiet. But he never really talked about his Falklands experience at all at the time. Subsequently, he has come over from Germany where he now lives and came to gave a talk about the uh, Falklands to a military history group that I'm involved in, hopefully. But um, at the time, he was very, very modest. And and in fact, I think on that particular experience, that was um, that was at um, RAF Beacon Hill, I had a fatigue party, and all of the private soldiers who were on the fatigue party, they were all ex-majors, either regular or TA. And I thought, that was quite amusing. And they they, they found it very abusing themselves, I think, really, to be in that position. One or two of them didn't stick it for more than a year or so. But, you know, we had this all the way through. And I mean, right at the very end, the final sergeant major was approaching 60, I think, at the time. Done his national service in the uh, Gurkha Rifles, then joined the HAC and ended up as senior major of the HAC. And then sort of 20 years later, then joined the Home Service Force. Uh, and uh, came in for the, the last three years, and he was a, a regular major, or certainly a, a very experienced major who was actually acting as a sergeant major. And we had this curious juxtaposition of ex-officers who were serving in the ranks, and people like me who was a, a reservist actually commissioned somewhat late in my military career. So, um, yes, it was an interesting match. There were other people of characters, and one or two who, didn't rise to any great, any great rank. Uh, there was a lovely man, no longer with us, unfortunately. His, he and his wife had a, a country house in uh, Hampshire, and on one training weekend, he was he was actually at the time a private, or he may have been sergeant, I think, but certainly he he suggested that we might have a training weekend at his, on his estate, and uh, we <laughs> this was quite irregular. So we all trooped down to Hampshire, and we were. My my, my um, cooking equipment and all the stuff was was put in the, the stable block and uh, soldiers bedding down in nearby outhouses, and uh, we were based on that estate. And the adjacent estate was somebody who was a ex guards officer, and so we had the entire weekend training on private land, which I don't think would be allowed now. But anyway, it was, it was an, an example of the kind of thing that happened in the HAC, but he was a lovely man. And I remember that um, we were lining up on our induction weekend and we met the admin clerk getting us, get, to guiding us through the paperwork to join. And they produced the form for pay and they, they, we were asked to insert a name of our bank. And he said, put your bank. And he said, oh, my bank. And the chap said, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. NatWest, Barclays, Lloyds? No, 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 my bank. <laughs> and it's, you know, the, completely, completely through the, through the, the bloke. One or two people, uh, you mentioned about ending up in the home service force. I mean, for some people, um, it was a jumping off point. It was, it was not the end of their service. Um, 
had one man who joined us, and he'd been he'd been in the regular army. I think probably a short service commission, uh, and he'd been in Northern Ireland, lost a finger or two. He joined us as a private, and he was in my platoon as a private. And then after a couple of years, he decided he uh, he'd like to sort of move on a bit, so he applied to his old regiment and was commis- recommissioned, and then took over a um, their own Hope Service Force company. And after the HSF packed up, he went back to his previous regiment as a full-time, as a TA. He ended up as a half colonel with an OBE, so HOC uh, private, turn, turned himself round as a half colonel. Another chap left us at the beginning and thought it was rather dull and needed a bit of action, so he decided to join the Royal Auxiliary Air Force as a paramedic, and within six months he was on a plane to the Middle East for the first Gulf War, and so he saw service as a paramedic on helicopters in in Kuwait. I love the story of the fatigue party with former majors. Did these people, I don't know, complain's probably the wrong word, but did they feel that they should be employed at a higher rank, or were they happy? being a private not at all not at all in those days certainly some people deliberately avoided promotion if they if they were you know, stockbrokers or partners in law firms it didn't necessarily need to have the responsibility in their part-time occupation because they had plenty of that in spades in their daytime jobs so they were quite happy to to, to put a muck in as um in in that sort of capacity i mean i i as a as somebody joining as an officer, I went along to sort of a local commissioning board at uh, Horse Guards, and uh, I went along with the taken along by our regimental colonel. Uh, I think I was the only one. I think there were only a couple of us were actually commissioned in the Home Circus Force, and uh, there was a you know general officer who was probably the GOC London District who turned up in his riding boots, and I think he thought this thing was a bit inconvenience. But anyway, he sort of sat in chair of this sort of small board. And uh, I was told by the colonel that um, when I was out of the room, he said, this colour sergeant is a, a partner in a city law firm. What's he doing as a colour sergeant? And uh, he couldn't understand it. And actually, I asked him the question, why was I a colour sergeant in the HSC? I said, well, colour sergeant in the HSC is a, you know, great responsibility and that's something i'm extremely proud to do and uh but now at this particular moment i'm you know very happy to apply to be a, an officer but the, the, the idea that you could have private soldiers who uh had important positions in the civilian world that were sort of quite different from the type of people you would get um in a, in a regular unit and as i think some regular soldiers find the hec quite extraordinary and um uh, I think when they first attached to Armory at Armory House, um, <laughs> some of them uh, perhaps were slow to catch on to the sort of the, the different style of the, the organisation. The fact that it's, it's very successful and it works despite the sort of informality and the sort of curious background that many of the soldiers have. I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit more about the exercises because uh, you did you did mention to me about an interesting RAF Northolt exercise involving the SAS. I, I touched on this earlier. That was our first London District organised training weekend, and that was the one where we were all put to work defending RAF Northolt, uh, and so each company had a particular area of the airfield or the outside of the airfield um, and we were told that we were having to defend this airfield from attack and other TA units including TA SAS units were actually acting as enemy on that occasion we had to capture them and so on uh, but as a kind of jokey diversion towards the end of his exercise from out of the sky from nowhere came uh, a microlight which flew over the boundary and <laughs> landed in the in the airfield and it was actually flown by um a chap who was an sas ta presumably sas 
soldier who managed to get across by rather his unorthodox means and was promptly captured. But um, it was it was a, a useful, it, it was an interesting diversion. Uh, I don't suppose it was scripted, but it was something that they thought would be an amusing thing to do and making a serious point um, to be looking on the lookout for the unexpected. And um, yes, but that was a, that was a, an interesting exercise. I mean, they 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 put the conflict was organised organised on a central basis. They obviously spent a lot of time putting the exercise together, so uh, that that made them all the more enjoyable and realistic. I mean, there were, there were other exercises later on. The Longmore camp in Hampshire comes to mind. We went there a couple of times, and they had a sort of tin city there. It was, it was built up to simulate what they would have had in Northern Ireland. And our job was to guard a key point, which uh, in proximity to this sort of tin city place where, where headquarters was based. And then we had crowds of civilians who were sort of banging tins and, you know, shouting and so on. So we had our checkpoints and barriers and so on were suddenly confronted with crowds of civilians who were obviously actors and they were obviously uh, military people. Uh, they were the act, acting out the role of the, the insurgents, some of whom would have been hostile and uh, troublemakers and so on. So they were able to produce that kind of facility. And so if we, uh, and if you had um, testing of our first aid skills, there would be an old helicopter or a crashed vehicle or something with bodies inside, the bodies being regulars who dressed up for the occasion with lots of ketchup and so on uh, to to provide patients to uh, to work on so so we had we weren't simply providing our own training internally it was actually these external people and that was great and the very last exercise we had uh, involved us spending um a day at Northolt and then suddenly we were t- we were moved by Puma helicopter from Northolt to Longmore in Hampshire, which one would have thought, um, particularly with the modern constraints, the idea of having helicopters used for that, it seems an unnecessary thing, but it, it made it very realistic and moved us quickly to get the maximum benefit from a two-day uh, training weekend. Yeah, so that, that, was, that, was, um, that was a successful and very memorable weekend. Uh, we had other, plenty of others. Um, uh, we went to North Hall twice. And uh, it was, as I think I mentioned earlier, I think it was it was clear that our wartime role, if it ever came to be needed, would have been to assist with the defence of Heathrow, which, when you see the size of the thing, um, of course, since then, they've obviously got higher fences and they've got uh, radar and various other sensors they wouldn't have had in the 80s. But certainly that was a big task. In fact, the one curious incident which happened on that occasion, um, we were headed for on the Saturday morning for this uh, visit to the police. I don't know whether you know Heathrow Airport, but the police station is on the north side, just out the side of the sort of perimeter. And for some reason, I don't know, can't remember why, I didn't go with the main party. I think probably I was travelling straight home. So I drove to the airport in my civilian Land Rover and met uh, and meet the guys who will be travelling on in a, I think, in a coach. And I arrived at the airport, uh, the airport police station, which was surrounded by double yellow lines. And I thought, well, where the hell do I park? And there's no uh, car park visible. So I, I drove, did another sort of circuit and came out a second time and discovered the back, there was a gate at the back of the police station. Uh, and in front of me, there was... Um, a police car. So the gates opened for the police car. I followed the police car in, and he, the driver of the police car, disappeared, going about which is leaving me to know where to go. And so I looked around and saw a door. I wandered in the back of the police station, and I didn't see anybody there. So I went down the corridor and I walked into the armory, which was the a guy behind the counter with a whole lot of Hector and Koshes on, on racks on the wall. He was rather startled. I was not wearing military uniforms, I was wearing a sort of blazer and civilian clothes. And uh, I asked if he could direct me to the conference room where our 
It was a presentation for the midnight. So he was rather astonished that I'd got into the police station by tailgating a police car. Um, and so I, <laughs> the uh, head of the police station he gave this sort of conference. And the first thing was to say, oh, Lieutenant Coles appears to have beaten their security by uh, arriving somewhat unusually at the back entrance of the police station. And uh, I thought that was quite interesting. I don't, I can't imagine that would happen now, but it seemed such an extraordinary thing to have done. But um, uh, it just shows that they probably needed a bit of military support to defend them in the event of uh, the steps and that's turning up. Defending airports is um, is obviously one of the, the main functions that, they, that we would have to do. And... The fact that they quite comfortably had five companies around one air, airfield for a test exercise, you know, what, how many they would have actually needed to to defend Heathrow. Of course, if you see uh, at the time when there were any uh, threatened IRA terrorist uh, attacks, you would find they would be uh, usually light uh, light tanks from the from Windsor would turn up regular um, lifeguards, I think and uh, regular units probably from London District. So our job would have been alongside them and alongside other TA, and there are obviously other TA units in the London area that would have had this uh, Home Service Force role, but uh, not actually in the Home Service Force. They would, they would be doing, um, I think, like things like the Royal Signals and people like that would be involved. Uh, so it will be a, a blend of different unif- units undertaking this work. I, re- I remember because the IRA did carry out multiple mortar attacks on the Heathrow, but I think that might have been in the 90s. There was quite a lot of trouble trying to track them down because it was such a large area um, to find out how they yes. were doing it. Well, you see, the Home Service Force was finally, uh, finally packed up in, in 1993. So when the Berlin Wall came down, that was a sort of signal. And, of course, Gorbachev, who we were hearing a great deal about following his death uh, very recently. Um, but I think that when the Soviet Union was breaking up, that's when the decision was made to, to produce the Home Service Force. And I think the first unit started winding down in, in 92. But the IRA was certainly active, and I had personal experience of that. Uh, we had one training weekend. For some reason, we had a training weekend which involved going to Bovington, which is the Royal Armoured Corps uh, base in in Dorset. I went to that weekend, was obviously a regular unit, so I was had breakfast in the officer's mess rather than uh, one would normally eat with the men, but uh, I was in the officer's mess and I was sitting having my breakfast and somebody came up with a with a message. Were they asking me to phone my wife because my office had been blown up and my office was in St. Mary X, which was the target of a, one of the IRA bombs. And um, so I had to give my apologies to the OC and I had to dash back to London. I had my own car with me, as, which was just as well, because I, had to, I came back on my own uh, and went to St. Mary X, where the office was surrounded by uh, sort of mine tape, police mine tape, and uh, a hell of a mess. And... Um, so, uh, yes, so my office was destroyed on that occasion. And some months later, we had a lecture at the HAC on one of our training evenings when some people from the um, Royal Engineers, I think uh, bomb disposal people, came along. And to my astonishment, one of the first colour slides that he showed in this presentation was an interior shot of my office. <laughs> uh, I don't know where he dropped it. must have been the press, but... Um, because the, the office building in St. Mary Axel, the front of it was, the contents of the front rooms were turned out, fell out into the street. And uh, that was a, a rather a shock, actually, uh, to see that. So at that particular time, and it seemed in a way ironic that we were, we knew that the hand service was coming to an end. But at the same time, the city was under attack. Uh, they were lobbing um, rockets at Heathrow or mortars or something. Um, they weren't very effective, but they were having a, a go. Uh, and it seemed ironic that when the home territory was under threat, albeit not the one that we originally formed to 
uh, guard against. It was, seemed ironic that we were being wound up when the IRA was still active. I mean, it was interesting what you, you were mentioning earlier, just uh, around one of the exercises where you had the army pretending to be like civilian protesters. Was that one of the things that you were potentially expected to deal with, civilian protests? Well, no, I mean, the, the, the point that one has to remember is that, you know, during peacetime, the, the, the police uh, are in charge of civilian uh, law and order. And so the army uh, would only be called in if requested to do so. But in a situation where there was perhaps a lead up to a war, then it's quite possible that one might have protesters. And at a key point, you could have protesters who would um, have among them people who were perhaps undercover special forces, that sort of thing. I mean, you think of Green and Common was an example, and Green and Common was obviously a, a base for the cruise missile, the American cruise missiles, and you had all the Green and Common people who were protesting outside. Now, if there was a lead up to war, you might have protesters, and you might have those protesters might be infiltrated by Spetsnaz people who at some moment would sort of force, you know, sort of under cover of that, would try and get in and attack whatever facility they were protecting. So, yes, it, I think it was to give us, in that particular exercise, it was to give us a feel for that kind of environment that could be a possible scenario. One thing I perhaps should uh, explain is that I, I was served in one of two AJC companies, B company, and then they decided to bring us into line with the HAC, the main body of the HAC. They decided to call us two company rather than B company. Um, but there was another company, one company as well. We do have a home service force veterans group, which I am the honorary secretary, and uh, we have an annual reunion, and that's when we get together. We probably see more of the one company people now than we did at the time, but um, it has a strong following, and that this is this is indicative, I think, of the impression it made on us. Because although it was not the high point of one's TA career, perhaps because you might have done something more exciting or more serious before the Home Service Force, this unique blend of the HUC people and the wider membership that came in because of the Home Service Force, it's it's sort of bonded together. And there's, Although every year now, regrettably, there's sort of one or two deaths every year, we seem to get more and more people turning up than we've ever had. It's quite bizarre, really. So uh, I suppose, uh, you know, it's the way with old soldiers. Many of them, it's um, something that binds them together. And so um, they turn up and regale the story. Not always, not stories, not always perhaps accurate, but um, as our memories fade, but uh, maybe a bit embellished. But nevertheless, we do, you know, sort of actively keep in touch and uh, are thankful for the time we had. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters. And I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road if you'd like to help the project just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate the cold war conversation continues in our facebook discussion group just search for cold war conversations in facebook thanks very much for listening and see you next week